हेलो 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 गुड नून टू ऑल वेलकम टू द सेकेंड डे ऑफ द वेबिनार सीरीज ऑन एडवांस इन मैथमेटिक्स ऑर्गेनाइज बाई टाटा इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ सोशल साइंसेज तुलजापुर टूडे वी हैव विथ आस प्रोफेसर विवेन पॉन्स फ्रॉम पैरिस सो द यूनिवर्सिटी फ्रांस हर रिसर्च इंटरेस्ट एरिया इज एलजेब्रिक कॉम्बिनेट्रिक्स शी इज ऑल्सो इंटरेस्टेड इन मैथमेटिकल सॉफ्टवेयर डेवलपमेंट एंड कंप्यूटर एक्सप्लोरेशन शी इज एन एक्टिव कंट्रीब्यूटर ऑफ सेज मैथ सॉफ्टवेयर she has published more than 30 research articles in various reputed uh, national and international journal she has also authored the book the hof algebra of integer binary relations she along with her team has developed open dream kit which is a open source package of mathematics users with which is like a blessing for the mathematics users in today's uh, more commercialized uh, place we are very delighted to have her with us today she is going to deliver her lecture on permutahedron and uh, associate hedron combinatorics and geometry now i request professor viven pons to address the web gathering before we start i just have one message for the participants if you have any question related to the talk please put that on chat box and the answer will be given at the last thank you have a nice day Unmute. You have to unmute. Yeah. Okay. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, Vivian Pons. Thank you for in the introduction, uh, um, and thank you for the invitation to talk at this uh, seminar. So I'm going to uh, present you an introduction to two uh, very nice objects in combinatorics: the permutahedron and the associahedron. Um, let's start right now. So. One of our main objects of interest today are going to be permutations. Uh, so permutations are very classical objects in combinatorics and in other areas of mathematics. So I've put here the list of different uh, the list of permutations of different size. So it's just you take the number uh, from one to n and you take all the ways to uh, permute them. Okay, so in size two you have two of them, in size three you have six of them, in size four you have 24, and in general you have n factorial. And now what I want to do is I want to put these permutations in, uh, in the space. So what I'm going to do is for each permutation I consider it, so a permutation of size n, I consider it as a vector of r to the n. So for example, the permutation one to three gives a point in space with first coordinate to one, second to two, and third to three. So we're going to do that with the permutation of size three, and we're going to see what we obtain. So I've drawn this little box here, uh, so it's to, 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 for us to be able to see in three dim dimension. And now we're going to place all the permutations of size three on it. So uh, you place the first permutation one, two, three over here because you, it all, it's on the x equal one line and on the y equal two, and it's on the um, on the top of the box where where the z is two, three, and then we put two, one, three, go there, three, one, two, go there, three, two, one, go there, two, three, one, go there, and uh, one, three, two, go there. And so now we have the six permutations, which are all on the exterior of the box. And I want to do the convex hull of the six permutations. So I'm going to look at, uh, to, yeah, I take the convex hull of the six points. And what I obtain is this. So you see it's a hexagon, which kind of cut the box. 
so one thing you will notice is that all the permutations are on the same hyperplane. And indeed, if you look at the sum of the coordinates, it's always equal to six. So it means that even though we are placing them in 3D, we actually obtain something in two dimension because we are going to project on this hyperplane where the sum of the coordinate is equal to six. So this is what I obtained while I was drawing by hand, but you can actually check was the software sage. So as, as it was introduced, I'm, uh, I use the software uh, Sage Math to help me with my research. And uh, I do many computations on this software. So I have also shared on top of the slides, I have shared a little demo, um, demo notebook where you can reproduce most of the computation of the talk into Sage. So I'm not going to show most, I'm not going to show, men, uh, I show it during the talk, but you can actually, uh, when the, it will be shared on the chat, the link to, to reproduce this computation. So anyway, if I put the list of permutations into Sage and I ask Sage to do the convexal of this, uh, why is this some, something there? If, I, I, I think someone is, can you, not yeah so if i uh please i think someone has uh is clicking on the screen or something because it's moving the slides without me doing anything and there is a blue no, line no. here no, that i didn't are, draw we are not doing anything <laughs> okay that's weird anyway so if you put the permutations into um if you put the permutation into into the space in Sage and you're asked to draw a polyhedron, it's going to show you this hexagon. So we are on 3D, but you see that we have a 2D hexagon. And now if I put the permutations of size four, I will obtain a polytope, a 3D polytope, which is called the and this is what we call the permutahedron. So the permutahedron is this polytope that you obtain by taking the convex hull of uh, permutation. Wait, uh, okay. So this is one, one construction and now we want to understand what is the combinatorics of this construction. So we're going to look at the skeleton of the polytope. Um, so you see uh, on the left here, you have the permutations into space and now on the right, I have just put, uh, the, the graph of this permutation. The only thing, wh what I've done is that I've selected, wait, I just need, yeah, this, yeah. I've selected one permutation, this one, which is the, uh, the identity. So it's, it's going to be always my, my starting point when I work on permutations. And I've given some kind of orientations to my polytope. So I oriented this way going away from the starting point and I look at the graph that I obtained and I obtained this new graph here. So this is my starting point. And now you can think of all the edges going upward like this. And this actually defines a partial order on permutations. So you, we're going to say that this permutation at the bottom is the minimal permutation and the permutation at the top is the maximal permutation. And when, when you can follow the arrows from one permutation to another, you're going to say that it's smaller than another one, but it's a partial order because for example, two, one, three cannot be compared to two, three, one. So how does it, how does this order uh, work? How does this uh, graph, how can we construct the graph without uh, going to the 3D pictures? Well, at each stage, we're going to switch two values. So for example, when I go from the minimal permutation to the one on the left here, I have switched one and two to become two and one. You see that the goal, we, we're starting from one to three, which is the minimal and the maximal is when all numbers are in the opposite order. So the goal is to switch the numbers. Okay, so here I've switched one and two to, two and one, and to go from two, one, three to three, one, two, I have actually switched two 
and three here and to become three and two. So the rule is that you take two uh, values that are consecutive. So I and I plus one and such that I is before I plus one in the permutation and you are allowed to switch them. So here I switch one and two, then I switch two and three and there again I switch one and two. To go the other way around, I switch first <coughs> two and three, then one and two, and then again two and three, and I get to three, two, one. So this is called the weak order on permutation. And it's actually called the left weak order. So why do we say left? Because now if you think of the weak order, uh, so the weak order, if you think of permutation, you're probably aware that the permutation, they form a group because you can multiply permutation together by applying a first permutation, then a second one. And this group is actually, um, is actually generated by transpositions and you, can, you don't even have to take all transpositions, you can take only uh, transpositions of consecutive values. And this is exactly what we've been doing here. We've been generating the set of all permutations using, uh, uh, we, we call them simple transpositions. And at each stage, we have been multiplying by a simple transposition and we've been multiplying through the left, which is why we call the left weak order. So this actually, this graph of the, permit of the weak order is the, is the, is the Cayley graph of the group of permutations by multiplying to the left. And if we can multiply to the left, it means that we could also uh, draw a similar graph multiplying to the right. So this is, uh, this is totally possible and actually it gives some kind, another order which is very close, which is called the right weak order. So now we have multiplying, we are multiplying through transpositions to the right. And what it means is that here we were switching values, numbers of consecutive values, but they were not always in consecutive positions. So for example, here two and three and three and two. And on the right, we are now always switching numbers that are consecutive in positions, but not always in values. So for example, here, I start with one and two and two and one, but here I'm now switching one and three, three and one here. So you see that this, these numbers are in consecutive positions, but not in consecutive values. Another way to see that is that the permutations on the right are just the inverse of the permutation on the left. So for example, if you take 3, 1, 2, the inverse of 3, 1, 2 is you look at the position of the 1, this is a 2. You look at the position of the 2, this is the position 3, so you write 3, and you look at the position of the 3 and it's position 1, and you obtain 2, 3, 1, which is the permutation that is here. So these two order are actually isomorphic to each other through uh, permutation inversion. It's, we're going, we, it's, it's good to have both in mind for whatever you do when you work with the weak order and the permutahedron. Sometimes I, I'm, so I use mostly the right weak order and I'm going to show you also other way to interpret it uh, in the geometry. So we have seen that in the left weak order, it gives the positions of the, of the permutation in space. Now I'm going to show you an example with the right weak order. Oh, wait, first I want to tell you a bit more about, about this order. So everything I say about the right weak order is also true for the left weak order because they are isomorphic. So I have said this is a partial order with the, so the initial element is the identity, the maximal element, either permutation n, n minus one up to n, up to one. So I've shown you what we call the cover relation is switching two consecutive um, numbers. So if you, are, if you know a bit about algorithmic, this is actually a sorting network and it, co it, it corresponds to the, the bubble sort algorithm, which is a very inefficient algorithm to sort, uh, to sort things, but the sorting network itself is interesting and it gives this graph of the, of the permutahedron. So here we switch one, we switch two consecutive numbers. This is the cover relations. And it, it gives us something in that 
once we have so this is the 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 part where we do a sorting is when we have switched two numbers so here one and three you see that all the permutations that are bigger to two three one four will have three before one so this is why we are really sorting this permutation at each step we are adding an inversion and this inversion is going to stay all the way up to the maximal permutation and another property I, i'm not going to say a lot about it today but it's actually very uh, important is that this uh, this partial order is actually a lattice so what is a lattice a lattice is a partial order where if you take two elements any two elements of your order and if you look at the intersection of what is smaller than these two elements so here this is what i've put in blue then this in intersection will have always a maximal a unique maximal element and same if you take everything that is bigger so to give you an example of something that would not be a lattice here i'm drawing this so you see that if i have an hexagon I, this is a weak order and this is a lattice but if now on my hexagon I add this relation and this relation well if I take this element and this element and I look at the intersection that everything that is smaller than the both of them I get the three elements and I don't have any maximal element to this set so this is the smallest example of something uh, that is not uh, a lattice. I see that there are people raising hands. So is there is something not clear. Maybe if you have a question right now about about this, we can just uh, you can ask it on on the chat, and someone can uh, ask the question. Is it okay? Yes, we'll write down the questions, and at the end of uh, lecture, we'll take that. Okay, but if something is not clear, maybe we should clear it out right now. So. Yeah, we'll ask them. Okay. Can we do a note to them? Okay, I'm going to continue, but if... If, if anybody wants to talk, they can unmute and they can talk. Yeah, if uh, those who are raising their hands, if they are having questions, they can ask now. Please do unmute and they can ask the question. I think, I think no question. We'll go ahead. Hello, you, you have to unmute, madam. Yeah. <laughs> Here. Okay. Here, back. So we've seen that it's a lattice. And now I'm going to go back to geometry. So another interesting property is that it's um, you can see the you can see the permutations at the reflection group, and this is going to give you the geometry of the permutahedron also. So now I'm looking at the projection on this uh, hyperplane where where the three the sum of the three coordinates is six, and I've drawn three um, three lines. The line where x1 equal x2, x1 equal x3, and x2 e equal x3. So uh, previously I used x, y, z, but actually because we're going to work in different dimensions, the easiest way to call the different coordinates is x1, x2, up to xn. And the interesting part is that if you take, uh, so you can start with the permutation 1 to 3, and then you're just going to apply reflections toward this blue line. So if you apply one reflection, x1 equal x2, you get to 2, 1, 3, and you actually have switched the one and the two. Now, if you apply the, the, the reflection x1 equal x3, you're going to 2, 3, 1, and here you have switched the one and the three. 
now here you apply the reflection x2 equal x3 and you have three to the three and the two and you can go on like this and in green i put the inverse of the permutation so the position of the permutation into space that's to give you a way to see both the left weak order and the right weak order with the geometry uh, in 3d okay so i want to tell you about something else is that we can actually from the combinatrix we get the vertices of the permutahedron but we can uh, get more than this we can get the whole geometry of the object which with this i mean we can understand what are the faces and especially i want to understand uh, i have the points here but i want to have a way to label those edges here so I'm going to do that. I'm going to start with one, two, three, and I've added this lines between one, two, and three. You will understand soon uh, why, because I want to specify that one, two, three really means that one is before two and two is before three. And now once I have switched two and one, I have two, which is before one and one, which is before three. But what would be the edge here? Well, the edge, you would have the one and two are still before the three because this is the case in both permutations, but you don't have the order between one and two because in the first one, one is before two and in the second one, two is before one. So we can write it like this. We have one and two with undetermined order and then we have this bar here and then three. So we have one and two together and then three. And we can actually do that for all the edges. Here we have two and after that we have one and three together. Here we have you, you can see two and three together here two three here three two then one bar and then one here we have one and then uh, if we go the so we start again at the identity and we go up we have one on the left and two and three on the right here we have one and three and two and here we have three and one and two <clears throat> and there is a last one so you see that the the vertices have two uh, separation bars. The edges have one. <coughs> <coughs> and we can add an, an extra one, which will correspond to the, the, the hexagon itself. And this is one, two, three, when there is no, um, no separation bar. The order between one, two, and three is not specified. And so this is, so this objects here, I called uh, ordered uh, set partitions. So you just take the number one to n and you put them into different sets and you order the sets, ordered set partitions, and they correspond to the faces of the permutahedron. And you can actually get the dimension of your face by looking at the number of bars. So the dimension is given by n minus the number of different parts in your uh, ordered set partition. So when you have three parts here, we're in dimension zero because n equals three, so it's three minus three. When there are two parts, we're in dimension one, and when there are only one big part, we're in dimension two. Uh, so it's actually, yeah, I, I forgot, it's n minus one. Yeah, I've forgot a minus one here, n minus one minus the number of parts. Okay, so this works in dimension. So this works with permutations of size three, and this is a picture with the permutations, with the permutahedron in dimension three, where you can see not all of them because some of them are, uh, are hidden, but you can see most of, you can see some of the faces <coughs> with ordered set partitions. So you can see that the faces of dimension two, so some hexagons here and squares are given here in red with uh, so it's just you a dimension two face here is just uh, you separate the set of uh, of the n elements between two sets something on the left and something on the right an edge here will have three different parts and a vertex will have four different parts and there is one big face that will correspond to the permutahedron itself which will be just one part with all the numbers into it so this, this picture is not from me, by the way. It's taken from someone else's talk. I have put the reference there. So this, is, uh, this gives us a, a combinatorial way to look at the faces, but it also gives us some geometry. I'm going to explain that to you now. 
so when we look at this uh, at this um, at this space, so here we're still on the hyperplane where x plus x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 6, and I've put back the three uh, lines. Well, if I do so, if I do, um, if I if I cut my plane into two through this hyperplane in, 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 in red here, through this line, I'm actually cutting my space into two parts. The part which is in white here corresponds to x1 plus x2 smaller than a certain value v, and the part which is in the red here corresponds to everything that is bigger than the value v. And we are going to use the combinatorix of the faces to give another construction of the permutahedron. So we've seen that we can construct it by taking the convex hull of permutations, but we can actually also take it by cutting our spaces through inequalities. And these inequalities are given by the faces. So let me show you here. We know that x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 6. Well, uh, this means that x1 plus x2 is 6 minus x3. And because x3, the minimal value is 1 and maximal value is 3, this means that x1 plus x2 is, com is comprised between 3 and 5. So this, in my picture, corresponds to this red band here. And I'm going to write it as two different inequalities, x1 plus x2 bigger than 3 and x1 plus x2 smaller than 5. So bigger than 3 would be this uh, bottom red line and smaller than 5 this big as uh, this up red line. And the second one, I'm going to write it a little bit differently using the fact that the sum of the coordinates is 6. This is exactly the same as saying that x3 is bigger than 1. And I can link that to two of my faces. So if I take the set, um, if I take the ordered set partition 1, 2, then 3, I will say that it corresponds to this inequality x1 plus x2 bigger than 3. And if I take the set 3, then 1, 2, I'm, I'm going to say that this, corres this corresponds to the inequality x3 bigger than 1. So the rule that I'm using is that. So j is a subset of the numbers 1, 2, n. So in my case, j here is here 1, 2, and here it's 3. And I'm going to use all the x, j for j in my uh, subset. So here x1 plus x2 because I have 1 and 2 and here x3, and I want them bigger than the size of j plus 1 chooses 2. So in my case here, it's uh, the size of j is 2, so uh, it's, uh, so it's 3, because size of j is 2, and this 3 chooses 2, so which gives me the 3 here, and in this case, it's size of j is 1, so size of j plus 1 is 2, and it's 2 cho chooses 2, which gives me this 1 here. Okay, and I can do that with all the faces. So, for example, now I'm going to add all the other ordered set partitions. So, 2, 1, 3 gives me x2 bigger than 1, and it gives me this line here. 2, 3, 1 gives me x2 plus x3 bigger than 3, and at at each stage, I'm doing the intersection of all these uh, inequalities and I'm putting the intersection in red here. So now I have 1, 3, 2, x1 plus x3 bigger than 3, and there's one last one, 1, 2, 3, x1 bigger than 1. And you see that if I take the intersection of all these inequalities, I get uh, the hexagon in red here, and this is my permutahedron. So this is the second way to um, construct your permutahedron. You can construct it by taking the convex hull of all permutation, or you can, uh, you, you can construct it by taking the set of this inequalities, plus you need to add um, the one that say that x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 6. So you have one equality that uh, give you the, the, the main hyperplane. And then inside this hyperplane, you cut them, you cut into uh, half spaces, and in the end, you construct your polytope, which is given by the hexagon here. So I've done it in dimension uh, two, but you can understand that it works in all dimensions. Okay. 
So now we're going to uh, let the permutahedron on the side and we're going to move to uh, on, on our other object of interest today, which is uh, the associahedron. But before that, we're going to um, we're going to use, we're going to define, we're going to start from the weak order and we're going to see how from the weak order we can obtain another uh, lattice which is called the Tamari lattice. For this we're going to define a surjection that starts from permutations and go to uh, binary trees. So I'm going to show you an example and you're going to understand what we're doing. So what we're doing is it's a very well-known algorithm called the binary search tree insertion. So I'm going to I'm, I'm reading a permutation from the right and I'm going to construct an object uh, uh, with the different numbers. So I'm starting with the number which is to the right of the permutation four and I write it there and it's going to be the root of a tree that I'm constructing. Now I'm reading the number two and I'm looking at is two bigger or smaller than four? Two is smaller than four so two goes to the left and because there is nothing to the left of four I'm just attaching two here. Now the three here, so three is smaller than four so three is going to the left of four and then I arrive at two so three is going to go to the right of two because three is bigger than two and here I'm attaching three over there. Now five, five is bigger than four, so five is going to the right of four. And because there is nothing here, I'm attaching it there. And one, one is smaller than four, so one is going to go to the left. Then I arrive at the two, and I'm going again to the left of two because one is smaller than two. And there, there is nothing, so I'm attaching the one over here. So this is some kind of a sorting algorithm, uh, constructing a, a, a binary search tree. It's actually used as a sorting algorithm to sort a list of numbers. And in our case, we use it as a, we can see it as a function that takes a permutation and construct a binary tree. So what is a binary tree? A binary tree is what we have here on the right. So there is a root and there is a left subtree uh, on, on the left of the root and the right subtree on the right and each subtree is itself a binary tree so it has a left subtree and a right subtree and sometimes uh, uh, some empty and it's, it ends when there is an empty tree on the left or on the right okay and now we're going to take all permutations and construct their binary trees so I'm going to do that here with the, the permutations of the of the right week order. So I'm starting with one, two, three. So I remember that I read my permutation through the right. So I, I construct three, then I put two to the left of three, and then one to the left of two. Now I'm doing two, three, one. So I do three, I put one to the left of three, and then I go to the left of three and to the right of one, and I put the two. Now two, three, one, I start with one, I put the three to the right of one and then I put the two to the left of the three here. And one, two, three, I start from the one, I go to the left, I put the two, I go to, I go to the right, I mean I, I put the two and then I put, go to the right and I put the three there. And then th three, one, two, I start with the two, one goes to the left of two and three goes to the right of two. And if I do three, one, three, two, I actually obtain the same tree because I start with two, then I put the three here, and then I put the one here. But in the end, even if the order of, if one, of one and three was different, I get the same tr tree. And this actually gives me some, um, uh, an equivalence relation on permutation. So I can put my permutations together into groups. So, if, if there is only one permutation that gives a tree, it's only one permutation in the group, but there, there are two permutations that give the same tree, so they are in the same big group, and this is going to define me uh, a quotient lattice. So I can define the Tamai lattice as a quotient lattice of the weak order. As You can understand it as if you were uh, kind of reducing uh, 
removing this edge here, you put these two elements into one and you get a lattice on five elements instead of, of six. This is what happens if you do it in size four. So for each, per, for I've put the permutations into big red groups. So in particular, a group is always going to be an interval of the of the weak order. It's it's a necessary condition to be a, a lattice quotient, and the, it follows also some other uh, properties that are that are telling us that the Tamai lattice is this uh, quotient lattice of the weak order. It, in particular, if you define an order between the trees by saying if there is one permutation in one group that is smaller than another, if there exists one in group one that is smaller than a permutation in group two, then you can say that the tree in group one is smaller than the tree in group two. And that defines a proper uh, partial order on binary trees. So this order is actually known independently of the permutations. It's called the Tamari lattice. Oh, wait, up. Yeah, so the Tamai lattice is a lattice on uh, objects counted by the Catalan numbers. So binary trees are counted by the Catalan numbers. I've put the formula over here. There are um, very common numbers in, in combinatorics. They count like hundreds of families of combinatorial objects. So binary trees are one of them, but they are not, they are not the only ones. And that means that you can actually define the Tamari lattice on many, many different, many, many different ways on using different families of objects. So here are some examples. So one that is very well known is that you can define the Tamari lattice as a triangulation of, uh, of, a pol of, of polygons. So if I look, for example, at the different ways to um, triangulate here an hexagon, I can count the different ways and I can organize it as, a, and it's going to give, I can define it to, so, so that it gives me a partial order and this partial order is going to be the Tamari lattice. You can see it on certain paths and I'm going to show that to you later, which are called the dig paths, so certain paths of, of the plan. You can see it on ordered forest, so we've seen binary trees, but we can also see it on forest. We can see it on certain families of permutations. And an, a last example I'm going to uh, give today is the way to parentize uh, uh, an expression, and that was actually the original definition of Tamari in the 60s. So the Tamari lattice was defined independently of the weak order. It's just one of its properties to be a quotient lattice of the lattice of the weak order. So I'm not going to show you all the different ways to define it. I'm going to show you one example, again, starting from the right weak order. So another way to obtain the, the Tamari lattice, which is not, not through binary trees, but through uh, 312 avoiding permutations. So what is a 312 avoiding permutation? So you take the letter 312 and you're going to look at all permutations where you can find three letters in this order was a relative uh, values that give 312. So, for example, in this permutation here, you have a 3 here and then 1, 2. So, we say that this permutation 3, 4, 1, 2 contains the pattern 3, 1, 2. But you don't, you don't always have exactly 3, 1, 2. For example, in this case here, you don't have 3, 1, 2 in this order. In the case of 2, 4, 1, 2, but you have here 4, 1, 3. And if you take the relative value of 4, 1, 3, so this would correspond to a 3. This would correspond to a 1, and this would correspond to a 2. If you forget that there is a, an actual 2 here, you take the relative value of 4, 1, and 3 together. 4 is bigger than 1 and 3, 1 is the minimal, and 3 is the middle element. So basically, when I say 3, 1, 2, I mean that I see something like this. A C somewhere, then an A, then a B, and I have A smaller than B smaller than C. So when I see that, I say that my permutation contains the pattern 312. And 
Well, I wanted the permutation that avoid this pattern. So I put in black the permutation where you cannot find the pattern 312. <clears throat> so these are the 312 avoiding permutations. And now if I take the induced uh, order on this permutation, so basically I just erase all the gray permutations here, I get a new order on the remaining permutation, and this is the Tamari lattice. So the previous uh, construction that I had shown you with binary trees, it explains how the Tamari lattice is a quotient lattice of the weak order. And this new construction here, it shows that the Tamari lattice is actually a sub lattice of the weak order. So another way to construct this, another definition, for example, here is on thick pass. I'm not going to explain exactly how it works, so, but you can, it's just the uh, thick pass is just a path that starts at zero, is made of up steps and down steps and stay above the line. And this is counted by the Catalan numbers and you can define a cover relation on thick pass that is going to create this lattice. So you can work on the Tamari lattice independently of the weak order. And you have many different ways to define it. And it turned out that the Tamari lattice is also the skeleton of a certain polytope. And this polytope is called the associahedron or Stashev polytope. You have many, many ways of constructing this, um, this polytope. It's, more, it's a bit more complicated than the permutahedron because the permutahedron, you just throw the permutations into space. You don't have anything to do because the permutation itself gives you a point that you can put in space. For the associahedron, it, it took time so that we could actually construct an actual polytope in space that would correspond to the, to the combinatorix of the Tamari lattice. So I'm going, uh, these are a few references that you can check out if you're interested. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the construction given by Lode in 2004, because it's uh, very beautiful and easy to understand, and it's directly related to what we have done with the weak order. Okay, so I'm going to explain to you how we can, for each binary tree, we can retrieve a point into the space. The same way that when we had a permutation, we would have a point in space. So for a permutation, it was easy because it was just the values of the permutation would just give the different coordinates. For a binary tree, we need a way to get these coordinates because there, it's not directly there. And this way here is the one given by uh, Lode. So I have a binary tree here. And the first thing I do is I'm completing my tree. So whenever I'm missing a, a left subtree or right subtree, I'm adding this, which is a leaf. So a leaf is going to correspond to an empty tree. So when, when there is nothing to the right or to the left, I'm putting a leaf. And now for each, um, for each point here, I'm going to uh, look at... So if you look at the numbers here, there are just... Uh, I've just um, uh, labeled the nodes from left to right. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I haven't made any specific choice for, for the, this is called the binary search tree labeling and it's, um, it's, it's characterizing of the binary tree itself. It's not, there is not different ways to, to label it. So, and now for each node, I'm going to count how many leaves I have on the left and how many leaves I have on the right, and I'm going to multiply them. And these are going to give me the coordinates of my point. So for example, the node 1 has one leaf on the left and one leaf on the right. So I do 1 times 1, and it gives me the first coordinate here, 1. The node 2 has two leaves on the left and two leaves on the right, so it gives me four, two times two. Now three has one and one. Four now has four on the left and one on the right, so it gives me four. Five has five on the left and one on the right, it gives me five. Six now has one, two, three, four, five, six on the left and three on the right, so it gives me 18. And seven has one and one. And eight has two and uh, <coughs> oh, there's a yeah. This is not an eight. It should be a two. Sorry, this is a typo. There should be two. Okay, and so <coughs> this is a construction that for each binary tree gives me a point in space. Now let's look at what's happening 
<coughs> if I take all my binary trees of a certain size, so here I'm, I'm going to take all the binary trees of size three, and I'm looking at the point that it gives into space. So, and I obtain one, two, three, two, one, three, three, one, two, three, two, one, and one, four, one. So one thing you notice here is that these points here are exactly the ones from the permutation. And this point here is different. One for one is the only one different. And if you remember my drawing with the big green shapes, this is what happens in the, in the weak order, right? You have two permutations here and here that have different points. So basically when the group has only one, when, when a permutation is, is, <coughs> is, only, uh, is sent to one tree and there is only one permutation sent to that three, the coordinate is going to be the same. But when the group has <coughs> multiple permutations in it, then it's going to give me a new point. Another thing that you can notice is that the sum is still six. So uh, all this uh, four ones here are permutations, so the sum is six. But one for one is, is not a permutation, but the sum of the coordinates is, is still six. So we are still in the same hyperplane. So, and now when I take this uh, cover, uh, convex hull of these points, I, so I will get a new polytope, but it's going to be in the same hyperplane as the permutahedron. So let me show you what I obtain. So this is what I obtained in stage when I, I put the points here. So here you can see this big pentagon <coughs> that uh, when I put the three, the trees of, of type three. Here, this is what happens when I put the, the trees of size four. So I get something in 3D. And the way that you were able, we are able to see this hexagon inside the pentagon here, like if I do this, I can see that I can see the permutahedron inside the associahedron. This is actually a property of this construction. Here is in 3D, I've, I've plotted the permutahedron and inside the associahedron. Okay. And I'm going to explain to you how that works. So we can do this with the uh, inequalities that I've shown you earlier. So I've told you that we can construct the permutahedron with a bunch of inequalities. Well, to construct the associahedron, actually we have to remove some of them. So we remember that we had a, a pentagon. So basically the two trees, the two permutations that were over here disappeared and we're going to make this inequality disappear. And now in red, we have a pentagon in the middle here. So I've made this inequality disappear, the one corresponding to this uh, uh, ordered set partition. So how can I decide which ordered set partitions I need to remove? Because in size three here, I remove one, but if I go to size four, I have to remove a bit more. So what is an ordered set partition in the case of the, of the hyperplane that define my polytope is just so I want something that is just uh, one dimension lower than the, main, than the um, full dimensional space. So I want some, here we're in dimension three, I want something in dimension two. If we're in dimension, uh, I mean, here we're in dimension two, I want something of dimension one. If we're in dimension three, I want something of dimension two. So I want just one bar, I want just two groups. So in general, I will have a, a, an ordered set with two groups of numbers, one on the left and one on the right. And I'm going uh, to look at the numbers of the left. And I want them to form an interval of numbers. So for example, here one, two is okay. When there is just one number is okay. Two, three is okay. But one, three is not okay because it's missing the two in the middle to be an interval. So this is why I'm removing this one. And if you look at the other, the others are okay. So I'm looking at the set on the left. So if you remember, I had the set, I call it J. So I'm not just taking certain, uh, I'm just taking a subset of this, uh, of this ordered set partition when the set J is, is forming, uh, contains all the number from I to a certain J that is bigger than I. And, if, and then I can define the uh, inequalities the same way as earlier, and this is going to give me the, the associate hedron. So if we go back here, 
you can see that here it's also obtained by removing some inequalities for example this one this one is removed uh, and this one here and this one here I think yeah so this these are inequalities that are cutting my my polytope inside and I just remove those inequalities so it's it kind of goes uh, further and this is how I, I obtain the associahedron and these inequalities I can select them uh, as I've just shown okay so I'm I'm finished for all the content but I'm going to leave you with uh, some references if you are interested in this topic so if you if you want to know more about the weak order you can so one way to to so why are we looking at this object there are a very there are the source of many many different research in combinatorics in particular because they can be generalized in many ways so one way that they can be generalized is because uh, the I, I told you that the weak or the permutation they form a reflection group they can actually they so you can be interested in other uh, reflection groups especially other finite reflection groups and you can define the weak order and the permutahedron and the associahedron for all these other groups so for example in this paper from uh, Lascaux and Schutzenberger they study different ways to order elements of uh, coxeter groups which uh, of, of which uh, this specific reflection group is a coxeter group and they look at the different properties of these uh, orders and lattices on in all different groups. There is also this paper of Bjorna and Vax looking at the different construction using permutations. And uh, this is what gives the, especially the binary search tree insertion and properties of the different, in, uh, of the, of the ways you can select different groups of permutation based on, on post-set construction. So some other things that, that I haven't mentioned today. So I've shown you the relation, the combinatorial relation between the permutations and the binary trees through uh, the weak order and timary lattice and the permutahedron and the associahedron. There is also another one that you, you can actually look at them as basis of, um, of a vectorial space that gives a, a, what we call an algebra and spe more specifically a hop algebra. And all the people studying half algebras and uh, combinatorial half algebras are interested in those, in those two sets because they are the same relation that we have with combinatorics and geometry. We also find it in uh, half algebras. So here are a few papers that uh, that look at this uh, relation, especially uh, the first one here, the algebra of binary search tree, from uh, Iver, Novelli, and Thibault. And the last one here from uh, reading the lattice congruences, fans and Hopf algebra, who looks at this uh, relations between the geometry and the Hopf algebra. And now the, the Tamari lattice um, is, has many different ways to be generalized to some other things. And all the things that we have seen today is like the first level, and then you can go and explore in many different ways. So you have the I'm, I'm giving you a few papers here. You have a, a, a very amazing work from Nathan Reading called Cambrian Lattices. And it's basically generalizes the way you, you've seen the way that I'm creating the binary tree through the binary search tree insertion and getting a new lattice. Well, in Cambrian Lattices, Nathan Reading explained that in a more general uh, setting, which also applies to other coxeter groups and defines a, a, a wide family of lattices of which the Tamari lattice is just one example. And each of these Cambrian lattice also gives a, a, a polytope. Then there is also another way to generalize that uh, that you can find in the work of Bergeron and preville ratel is that instead of binary trees, you can actually take trees with, um, so for example, ternary trees or quaternary trees, and this is going to define you what we call the M Tamari lattices. So this is what they call the generalized Tamari posets. And this has been also looked at by Preville Ratel and Vieno by an extension of Tamari lattices where they define even more generalized Tamari lattices. And this raised a bunch of different questions, especially um, both on the combinatoric side and on the geometric side. And I'm 
finishing with two of my own papers. I haven't had time to tell you about my own research, but everything I do is based on uh, on this object and I, I, I look at different questions related to them. So there is one paper that is called Permetries that is really the generalization of what we have seen today because I define we define um, a family of uh, combinatorial objects that are in between binary trees and permutations and they kind of explain this relation between um, the associahedron and the permutahedron. And another uh, more recent paper about was uh, Cesar Ceballos is the s week order on s permutahedra and in this case we cut the, um, the permutahedron in two little pieces like a like a puzzle and and it's uh, and it's also based on what I've uh, been talk telling you today and on this I'm going to stop now and if I'm ready to answer your question thank you very much Yeah. Uh, Professor uh, meeting yeah. within. Thank you. Thank you for uh, accepting mm -hmm. our invitation and giving your valuable time. The talk was very knowledgeable, the style of the presentation, such a complex specialization area of the lattice theory in a simple term. It was really commandable. I'll request you uh, if you can say something about the sage mathematics uh, in a few words. It will be grateful to us. Then yes. we'll take then we'll take a question answer session. Yes. Yeah, so uh, as it was uh, said at the beginning of the talk, I am actually a contributor and promoter of this uh, software Sage Math. So Sage Math is an open source software uh, that has been created mostly by researchers. Uh, it's free to use. You, uh, it's available on the web. It's open source, so it means that you uh, not only it's free to use, but it's you, you have access to all the sources. You can actually become a contributor yourself. You uh, you you are free to reuse it, redistribute it, etc. Et um, and uh, so I I myself I'm using this software for my teaching and also for my research. And I have so I. I have shared, I've sent to the organizer a link to a demo notebook and if you click on this link you will be taken to a website and you can you will be able to redo the computations of the of the chalk by yourself in Sage and if you are interested in knowing more uh, about Sage and uh, or how to use Sage in your in your schools or in your university or anything, you can definitely email me and I will either answer you directly or point you to the right person to do that. Yeah, thank you If from audience if anyone have a question. So they can unmute themselves and they can ask the question directly. Please. That's Ah, Bodke sir, you want to ask any question? No, sir. Yeah. So, you can also type your question in the chat and then the organizer can read the question to me. Presentation. Uh, sir. Uh, I think she is uh, waiting for this. Sir, hello, sir. Hi, yes. Sir, the, is there another software for mathematics? New software is I mean, You mean another than Sage? There are plenty of other software. Uh, the one I use is Sage. I'm, I'm specifically... I, I, I myself, as a as a researcher, I like to uh, to promote open source software and use open source software. But you also have uh, private company software that sell um, mathematics software, such as uh, Maple or Mathematica. And it, but you have also a bunch of other open source. For example, for for group computation, you have GAP. Uh, you have um, other other languages such as Julia, which 
off, which offers uh, options. Sage is mostly written in Python for if you're curious. Um, yeah, there are plenty of options. I my 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 choice my choice of software is Sage, but it doesn't mean that it's the only one. So I see. Is there any relation between the binary trees and the indices? You mean the um, the numbers inside the binary trees in the inside the nodes? So let me. Um, uh, yes, because this this is just one way to yes, to to give a, um, a standard labelization of the binary tree. I'm just uh, labeling the wait. I have, to go back there. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, this is one way to uh, to uh, give a standard labelization of binary trees. I just label the nodes from left to right. And in this is graph index. I don't. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Sorry. Is there a new relationship between binary trees and indices? Graph index. I don't know. No. Is there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Huh. Yes. Hello. Okay, good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, my question is, what's the relationship or what's the purpose uh, between the binary trees and the purpose of three-dimensional permutation? The, which one? You mean when we put the three the trees mm -hmm. here in space? No, I mean the two-dimensional permutation is okay to understand, but when we work for the three-dimensional or four-dimensional, then what will be the purpose of binary trees in those uh, combinations? I mean, so, so what's it's going the purpose to be, of that? It's going to be the same as in, uh, in two dimensions. So some of the trees are going to give some... Uh, wait, this is not me. I'm not doing this. Um, clear. So in, in two dimension, here I given the example in two dimension because there are not so many trees, but it, it works exactly the same way in higher dimensions. I see a question here that says, what are the applications of common atrix? Well, it's a, it's a why question. So, in my case, I do uh, fundamental research, so I'm looking mostly to answer questions that arise in other areas of mathematics. So, such as uh, and combinatorics appear in many different uh, many different domains, such as uh, algebraic geometry, in representation theory, to understand group theory, to understand certain polynomials. To basically, we we'll try to to uh, to give an interpretation, a combinatorial interpretation to some results that appear in algebra and sometimes solving some questions, seeing the relations between different problems that, uh, that gave some similar numbers but were not so easy, the, where the, the connection was not so easy to see. And I myself, I'm, I'm both a mathematician and com a, a computer scientist. I work in the Department of Computer Science. And what I do is really discrete mathematics. So the way I approach the subject is through algorithmic and uh, and programmation, as you have seen. And this this objects appear in also in algorithmic. For example, I, I I forgot about the reference now, but I saw a paper about machine learning that was using the permutahedron. I was really surprised to see that this is not my area, so I don't know exactly how it works. But I know that this kind of objects and understanding the structure of this of of these objects can help in algorithmic in general. I have some extra noise here. Is there any more questions? Yes. Okay. I, I think no more question from the audience, yeah. right? Okay, once again, uh, very much thankful from our uh, Institute, Tata Institute of You're Social welcome. Science, Tuljapur, and from our organizing committee along with me, there are two more faculties, colleagues with me, Sasmita Swain, who introduced you, and uh, Professor Dr. Sri Krishna Sudhir. So both are 
working together with me to make this event successful so thank you once again to professor vivin from uh, our side and thanks to all the participants